So the, the thing that I got accused of um, by the Daily Mail three years ago was that I was Professor Tell's students to grow cannabis. Um, I wasn't telling them to grow cannabis, I was just saying that if they did choose to grow cannabis, it shouldn't be a criminal offence because I believe in the decriminalisation of possession and home cultivation of cannabis. And I believe that is part of a strategy that I've described as progressive decriminalisation, where we remove the harms of criminalisation from the people who use cannabis and other drugs. And we also move to eradicate the social conditions of poverty, homelessness, and unemployment that produce problematic drugs. But the problem is if you believe in progressive decriminalisation with an incremental change towards a more liberal market, then you have to think about where are we getting to with this. And recently in the United States, we're starting to see examples of where we could get to with this. So as well as being a criminologist within the UK, I'm also president of the International Society for the Study of Drug Policy. And over the last two months, we've had meetings in New York, in Sydney, in Auckland, in Canberra. And this issue keeps it coming up again and again. Now there are examples of regulated commercial markets for cannabis. Can we move to a regulated legal market without increasing the harms of cannabis? But we have heard some of them today. So that's what I'm going to be talking about in this presentation. So I just want to start some, with some assumptions that some cannabis is harmful, some cannabis use is harmful. The majority of users do not experience harms, but some do particularly the ones who start young and continue to smoke heavily. Heavy, heavy level, higher levels of use incur the highest levels of harm. And th there's two dynamics in this process. Businesses want to maximize profits. That applies to legal or illegal businesses. That's what they're there for. And public health analysts and policy people want to reduce harms. So you've got a tension between the two main players in the emerging cannabis market, the public health regulators and the businessmen and women on the other side. Now you could say that we might want to have policies that actually maximise the benefits of drug use, um, and that would, might lead to a different discussion. But given that Danny Kushlik, one of the most prominent drug reform campaigners today, said that he was about reducing harms, let's focus on this if we, as if we're thinking just about reducing harms. And if we think about that dynamic between business and public health, we don't have to look far for examples of how that dynamic plays out. We can look at alcohol markets. Alcohol, like cannabis, is a recreational substance that people take because they enjoy it. Most people take it without many harms, but some people have harms. And we can look at what's happened in the alcohol market as an example of what might happen in the cannabis markets. And what's happened in the alcohol market in the UK over the last 40 years, 50 years, is that prices have fallen and consumption and the rate of harms of alcohol have gone up. And this isn't just you know, a bivariate relationship. There are lots of studies that show that the demand for alcohol is price elastic. If you, do, if you reduce the price of alcohol, people will use more. There are also studies showing that the demand for cannabis and other illicit drugs is also price elastic. There's no reason to think that the usual laws of supply and demand don't operate. And that if you reduce the price, use won't go up. And what's going to happen in a legal cannabis market is the price will fall, and could potentially fall dramatically. So this is work uh, produced by John Colkins and speaking from Rand about looking at the different prices we see in the market. So this is the wholesale price of a pound of marijuana in um, illegal markets in the USA as calculated in 2008. And you see, if you end up, if you have a, a more quasi-legalized medical marijuana system, you reduce the price because you're reducing. When, but they, this goes back to economics and the idea that when you buy illicit drugs, you're paying high prices because you're, buy, you're paying a premium to the producer and the dealer and everyone in the chain for the risk they're taking. If you take the risk out, you reduce that premium, the price falls, even if nothing happens the way you're producing it. But if you, make, if you go further and you put it in a legal market, then you can generate huge economies of scale. You don't have to hide it away. If they've calculated that if you were producing marijuana outdoors in fields and extracting the THC out of it, the price would fall, the price of production would fall to a tiny fraction of what it currently costs to produce cannabis. And so therefore, given that there's high demand, we would see both a reduction in price and potentially massive profits for the people who get into this as a business. The problem with this is that even though we've said, and it's been said today, that the majority of users do not experience harm, that is not where the cannabis industry will make its money from. 
like the alcohol industry, the cannabis industry, will make its money from their heaviest users. So between 70 and 80% of the profits of the alcohol industry come from people who are drinking in hazardous levels. Okay, Dave Brown, my colleague, points on research on that, because they're drinking the bulk of the product. And here we have graphs of the proportion of people who are in each sort of segment of this market. This is per year users, and the day users are black, in the black group. So they make up quite a small proportion of anyone who's used cannabis in the last year. But they make up a massive proportion of the actual amount of cannabis that is produced and consumed. This group is where the profits are made. This group are the ones that the cannabis industry will have an incentive to grow. The cannabis industry will want more and more people to become heavier and heavier users, just like the alcohol industry wants us all to become daily frequent users of alcohol. So there is a lot of money in the system and an industry being created which has a huge incentive <coughs> to create more harmful patterns of <coughs> And it will be, have a, a variety of tools at its disposition to be able to increase this market. So, for example, if you legalize a market without restricting advertising and the, all the other tools that it can use, then it will use those tools to increase the profits. It will advertise. We're seeing that. We saw an example on the first slide there, an advert, an advert for cannabis. We're seeing advertising happening in Colorado and Washington where they legalize recreational cannabis. You'll see price promotions probably familiar with the buy one get one free promotions uh, for alcohol, There's, those things will happen for cannabis. The cannabis industry is already sponsoring events, so we do have competitions for horticulturalists in cannabis for the high times prize, and there's sponsorship by brands of those, those brands and those growers. And we also see product innovation, which Adam's already talked about. The idea of very high concentrations of THC in waxes, oils, and tinctures, new modes of administration, such as vaporizers, and what they discovered in Colorado when they legalized two years ago, a big unanticipated problem, was the very quick development of wide, wide, a wide variety of edible forms of cannabis. And so you would see an industry that would want to innovate to get its product into more and more modes of administration, so more and more people are using it. Governments may well try to restrict that, but there are various ways in which the alcohol industry works against being regulated. And there's no reason to expect that the cannabis industry wouldn't do the same. As they get more profits, they have more money available to lobby politicians. They can engage in lawsuits, such as the lawsuit that the alcohol industry is engaged in with the Scottish government when it tried to impose a minimum price for alcohol. Um, there'll be the issue of regulatory capture. So we see in the UK what I think is a rather ridiculous situation where we've got the alcohol industry sitting on the groups that make the decisions about how alcohol will be regulated. And as the our cannabis industry grows, the same thing might happen with cannabis, especially because there's the prospect of revenue sharing. So if you get into the argument that it's a good reason to legalize cannabis that it produces government revenues, then you're giving not only the industry, but the government an incentive to grow that market. So both on the commercial side in terms of the promotions they've got available to them, and the regulatory side in terms of the pressure they can put on the regulators, there is a reason to fear the cannabis industry growing its market. We've heard about various forms by which cannabis can be regulated. And here again, I've put them into a kind of hierarchy, similar to the one that Jonas showed us earlier, from the most restrictive to the least. I've not put in the medical prescription model because this is about recreational cannabis. That's where the big market probably is. And at each level, there are ways that this can, the industry can lever itself into the next level. So, for example, with cannabis social clubs, which has been proposed as a way of limiting and people sharing, pooling and cooperating and sharing, fantastic. I'm, I'm, I'm all for people sharing their gardening skills and producing cannabis for their own purposes. What we're seeing, with a few examples in, in, in Barcelona, for example, is cannabis social clubs that are morphing into a form of coffee shop because it's very easy to get membership of that cannabis social club. It's not your pooling, your own amounts. You're just really buying from the business that's producing cannabis. And then you see the cannabis social, so they get to a coffee shop model. And the coffee shop model, I asked my brief earlier about the backdoor regulation. There are already campaigners, lobbyists within the cannabis industry in the Netherlands campaigning to be given more freedom to grow and sell, produce and sell cannabis. 
So that might lead you to a state monopoly system such as we saw with the Gothenburg model. It's named after a town in Sweden, but it was actually quite popular in many counties in the USA where counties, after prohibition, decided they wanted to still be restrictive, so they took over monopolies of the production and sale of alcohol. But those eventually eroded because consumers campaigned for it and the business was able to campaign for it. So you see very few state monopolies in the US these days, even though there are still some kind of in Scandinavia. But also there's been a recent proposal from the Canadian Association for Mental Health to have this idea of a state monopoly of the sale. State monopoly of sale, you still have these potentials for regulatory pressure, sorry, pressure on regulators from the industry to move to the next level, which is state licensing. So in this one you've got the state producing, in this one you've got private companies being licensed by the state. Those, those, those companies are obviously buying licenses because they can think they can make a profit. They can use those profits to campaign, to have less onerous regulatory burdens placed upon them, helping them to move to what we have in Colorado, which they've jumped straight to, which is a near free market model. And the problem, one of the problems with Colorado and other, other US states is that they can't ban advertising because in the USA, commercial speech is free speech. So they've gone, and many of the states that look like they might be um, regulating candidates in these different markets will have, will be going into that model straight away. So there's a logic, a problem which is what I've called the 11th P. So Bo Kilmer has come up with this list of 10 things. It's not just the price. There's purity, there's um, how, how rope can vote, what to do about prevention, all of them. The industry will want to have a role in deciding all these things and making it the least restrictive possible with the most opportunity to, to, to promote cannabis use daily and frequently. And they'll be able to use what they'll be accumulating as the market grows, which is their power. So I'm saying that the, 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 after Boko's 10 Ps of cannabis marijuana globalization, we need to think about the 11th P, which is the power that the industry will accumulate to resist regulation and expand the market. So we saw earlier the, the U-shaped diagram from Transform, Steve and Danny, as the U-shaped diagram, which sort of has a nice sort of visual metaphor, because it looks like the ball just rolls to the bottom and stays there. But what I'm arguing is that unless we're, unless we're very careful, unless we're very careful in how we set up regulation and how, what mechanisms we use to prevent regulatory capture and the promotion of the bigger market, there's no reason to expect that the ball will stop at the bottom of that U-shaped curve path. The industry and the powerful social influences it will gain will tend to move that ball of harm along to forwards along to a corporate free market model with harms that are greater than we would otherwise want from a public perspective. So I'll leave you with this question. Is it possible to create a regulated cannabis market without the enlarging industry eventually to create a fully commercialized market? Thank you. So thank you everyone. I think we'll take one or two questions from the audience. Can we take a question in the back? Um, I wanted to ask what the panel view on the new legislation around uh, new psychoactive substances. Um, and if, as I suspect, you're not a fan of it, what do you see as an effective, immediate solution to stopping some of the harms people are experiencing from using new psychoactive substances? Um, at the end of last year, I published a paper in the National Journal of Drug Policy um, with my colleagues Ruth Fultz and Fiona Mission and Harry Summer, in which we called the New Psychiatric Substances Act um, legally flawed, scientifically problematic, and potentially harmful. I had wanted to call it um, legally absurd, scientific nonsense, and definitely harmful, but my colleagues have it back. Um, the act is absurd, um, primarily because the definition that's been adopted of psychoactive substances means that uh, no court will be able to tell whether the act actually covers it or not, and that's much better qualified than I am to explain why that is. Um, it's potentially harmful because it will, it will push the market underground, and when the market goes underground, there'll be more harmful. Of use, and I'm particularly concerned about the development of high frequency injecting of stimulant catalytics, which we've seen some examples of in the UK, we've seen much more of in um, other European countries. But when you merge the market 
to which injecting drug users are going for the heroin with a market for quite attractive stimulants that have quite high effects effects when you inject them. We would expect to see some pretty horrific things happen. Um, there are better ways of looking at this. Um, the expert panel that came up with the recommendations um, that the government used as a basis for the Psychiatric Substance Act did very briefly consider a uh, training standards model um, whereby these substances were not legal highs. It is already, it was already illegal to sell substances when you're being reckless as to the dangers they, they, they have. So under the general, under Regulation 8 of the General Product Safety Regulations, it was already illegal to recklessly sell synthetic caffeinomas and cannabis and other substances. So we could have adopted a much more intelligent, harm-reducing way of regulating head shops than just banning them and forcing them up. I agree totally. I think it's unenforceable. Um, the lawyers that are experts in this field said the same. Um, you know, chemicals in your brain will, will be illegal by that definition. Um, who's going to test them? They don't even have a definition of what psychiatric means. So it's really not fit for purpose. I mean, I agree as well, but I just kind of have to be slightly devil's advocate. Because the truth is, if a cannabis product are really nasty, I really don't want those drugs widely available either for patients of mine who pick up serious habits on them in prison or you know, young people out there smoking. You're 30 times more likely to land in hospital smoking synthetic cannabis products than you are natural weed. And so I, I, anything that would be quite nice to get rid of them, honestly, is a really good thing. If by some miracle this law did have a positive test, and I think it's limited, because actually the truth is in the UK at the moment, 60% of people buy their NPSs online, there's been a year on year increase in people buying them from dealers. There's been a decline on shops, you'll reduce high street access with the law. But the best possible thing that can happen is that people then return to traditional drugs, um, which would be a really good thing. But if that's going to happen, then the government has to then start educating how to use traditional drugs better. And they've totally forgot that that might be an inevitable consequence. We've got a little story coming out tomorrow about what drugs people would have on a desert island. So we've asked people, you're on a desert island, and it's full of weeds and magic mushrooms, and by some bizarre miracle, you've got loads of really good coke and really good MDMA. And a passing genie comes by and says, you can give up any of those traditional drugs to any NPS. I can't tell you the results, because it's all in bar until tomorrow morning. But what I will tell you is, most people aren't stupid, and given the choice and the resources, people pick nice drugs. The government could have done a little bit of NPS, they could have been honest, and they could have used it as an opportunity to start having an honest dialogue with people. But they haven't done that, they've just come up with something dark and unenforceable, which will probably resolve all the final question over here. Yeah, I'm going to from a fellow opio farmer, I must admit uh, we've been wondering about this for many years. What does it mean uh, when you talk about cannabis dependency or addiction? Because we don't get it. I mean, we crawl up the walls and we're trying to go off that dirt area in a boat. So what does that actually mean? So the most common things you would find in people who are cannabis dependent would be loss of control, so using more than they want, development of tolerance, so they need more to get stoned, continuing to get stoned despite negative impacts upon their health, their well-being, their emotional, you know, their activities. Um, about two-thirds to three-quarters of daily cannabis users, when they stop, get withdrawal symptoms, they can't sleep, they become moody, they become irritable, um, and, and it, you know, it ruins their life. I mean, if you clearly don't fit, you don't get the same terrible withdrawal. But, you know, don't kid yourself. I think there's a lovely description of cannabis addiction which goes somewhere like this. Um, cannabis addiction never gets so bad or so severe that it ruins your life, but slowly but surely it ends away at the things in life that matter, and I think it diminishes people's opportunity for potential in things. The problem is, of course, that people who are most likely to grow up cannabis dependent are the kids who start using cannabis at the age of 10 or 11 or 12, and that 10 or 11 year old kid is not that kid's problem is not cannabis. It's the life they come from. So I think what Alex said is absolutely right. What you really want to do if you're going to introduce drug policy is have a society that's far more equitable and fair and looks after the most disadvantaged, which clearly our current government has no interest 
in doing at all. So what you're left with is picking up the pieces. But the people I see who seek treatment, cannabis has ruined their lives. You know, I mean, my, of all the people who broke my heart last year, I've got a 49-year-old patient who's been smoking for 35 years. He has a lung age of 85. He has end-stage COPD. At the end of, beginning of last year, he weighed probably about 9, 10 stone. He's only a little lad. By the end of last year, when I saw him, he was put on so many steroids, he's blown up. He will die by the time he's 52. He's got four kids. He will not take his kids, rather than be teenagers, not because he was a heroin user, not because he was an alcoholic, but because he smoked cannabis and tobacco every day for the last 35 years. And that will kill him. That's Uh, in the interest of time, I think we're going to leave here. Please uh, help me to thank our panel on this wonderful occasion. Thank you.